Okay, so I'm just going to talk to Grant Bias. Uh, I'm the software design engineer with Imagination. Um, I'm also the current GIS chair now, I've just taken over from one recently. Um, but I'm not going to talk to you about that today, I'm just going to talk about Vulcan. And uh, I personally have been working on Vulcan pretty much since we first started talking about signing it. Uh, so it's was the whole run that Tom talked about. So, synchronization. Uh, I titled this call, Keeping Your GPU Fed Without Getting It. What that point is better. So, if you've got an application and you want to render something to the screen, then you've got, you've got a bunch of draw calls. Uh, you've, got, you've got a bunch of draw calls that you want to get pushed to the GPU that you can render. And your GPU is there, it's there for a purpose, and that purpose is to render those things. So, you kind of want to go to them, and you want it to have it at all times. Come on, you ruined the slide again. Ah, oh, what is going on with this? <laughs> Never mind, it's fine. The angle of the GPU is still there. Um, and ideally, you want to keep it as fed as often as possible. You don't want the GPU to be sat waiting around whilst you're sort of still defining what your commands are. You want your commands to be defined as soon as you know what they are, and you want your GPU to take that and work immediately. But you've got to be careful. Uh, if you do it wrong, you mess up, it will find you. Uh, Right, so specifically what I mean by keeping it fed. Um, like I said, you don't want to wait around for you to define operations. Uh, if you've got some CPU work to do, you ideally want your GPU to do something while that's happening. Um, even within the actual operations you want your GPU doing, there's a good chance that bits of those operations may be quite, may take uh, a lot of time or four stores on their own, such as memory accesses. Um, and ideally, you want a lot of operations employed at the same time so that it can hide the latency of those, those stores. Draw calls themselves are actually pretty good at this. They've got a whole bunch of different pipeline stages we've talked about, um, and they tend to have a lot of things implied in GPUs very parallel, so they've got a lot of different fragment shaders running at the same time and other shaders as well. So there's a good way, of, even within a set of draw calls, to provide this, uh, these very tasks. The basic principle is that you don't want to serialize your tasks. Uh, you take a very naive approach, which I'm hoping none of you are doing, it, of uh, basically defining your work on the CPU, borrowing it off onto the GPU, then waiting for that to complete, and then only then doing your next set of commands, and you're going to serialize the system, and the whole time you're defining stuff on the CPU, the GPU is doing it. Still happening. Right, out you come. Fine. That work. Yeah, right, arrows work, we'll use that. Fine. Um, what you can do instead is you can pipeline it so that you can start your work on the GPU and whilst that's happening you can start defining your next CPU task for the next frame and by doing that you overlap and you get a lot more work done in the same amount of time without anything just sitting around waiting for no real reason. And equally uh, when it comes to even a set of draw calls, um, if the GPU is just to serialize the vertex and fragment work, you get maybe two done in this time, but really by pipelining, which is what all modern GPUs do, you can have your vertex and fragment work operating at the same time, and basically, again, making sure you aren't hitting any latency. And you want to not get in the way of that. And the other sort of half of this, this talk is about not getting bitten. So the GPU is going to be consuming a lot of resources, accessing a lot of objects whilst it's doing the work for you. You can go on here, use this texture, render this using this render pass, um, use these objects and whatever else. I've got this command up for instance, all the life that others have talked about today. And if you touch any of that while it's actually being used, basically under my behavior happens. You don't have any safety. Okay, that's not the clicker's fault. Good times. Um, I just have two pictures, apparently. There is a ghost. So, Uh, yes, so you don't want to be deleting anything um, whilst being used because then the GPU may see just data that's not there anymore. And if you update the contents of a texture, you may get the GPU reading it halfway through your update, for instance. Um, so that can look like any number of things. Um, you're lucky, I say lucky, it's not really. Uh, nothing will be wrong, and you screwed up, and it's all fine. For a little less lucky, you might get some tearing in your images, say like you've updated an image at the same time in two places and you're reading from another place and you get tearing. You may get image corruption. Uh, that's kind of bad. What? I'm, I'm 
really not touching it. What is going on? Stop <laughs> <laughs> it. Voice actually. It's terrible. Um, it's a good <laughs> or everything might just explode, ruin your day, and then, oh, no, everything's shut down. Never mind. Well, apparently, it's got a lovely green <laughs> filter for sharing its monitor. Fine. Ah! <laughs> Use the, the, those of you on the phone are not really sure what's going on. Uh, the, the laptop's kind of doing things on its own. I don't know why. It's pretty helpful. So, <laughs> onto the serious bits. So, the serious bits again. so it's a bit of terminology just to set you up for what I'm about to talk about. Uh, when I say an operation, I basically mean a set of something that can be executed on the GPU. Some work for the GPU is going to have to get done. And very importantly, this actually includes synchronization events. So if you have something that's setting an event to signal it or waiting on an event, that is a task and an operation in and of itself. Uh, execution dependencies, um, these are basically a task saying, I depend on another task. So you might have some draw call that depends on an earlier draw call finishing, and that's a dependency if, if, you can, if you're expressing that dependency as an execution. There's also memory barriers. Now, this doesn't mean the same thing as GL. Uh, I'll explain more about that, what the difference is in a minute. Um, but a memory barrier effectively is an operation that flushes and validates caches and basically determines what parts of the pipeline, what parts of the GPU you can see um, the results of other things that have been written or um, accessed. And finally, a memory dependency is a combination of those two things. It's basically an execution dependency where one, one or uh, a couple of the uh, top operations that we depended on are in fact memory values. So there's three rough buckets that um, you can sort the synchronization types into in Vulkan. Uh, the first type is very fine-grained. These are pipeline barriers mentioned in subpass dependencies. All of these operate within queues and typically within a command buffer that they can span multiple command buffers. Uh, and they all have very explicit memory dependencies um, but, and have very fine grained control over the execution dependencies as well. There's also semaphores. Now, these are um, between different queues. You can use them within a single queue, but there's not huge amounts of point, um, in certain circumstances. They're typically used to synchronize if you've got multiple queues on the system. Yeah. And finally, fences. Uh, these are quite heavy, weight, um, but they are useful. And these basically allow you to go, here's some work I've done on the queue, um, and when is it complete? That's basically what it's for, is to say when a set of queue operations is complete. This is in contrast to something like where Jill has two quite coarse primitives, which is the memory barrier, which again, very vaguely mentioned, I will cover more of the why that's different, and Benz is never kind of similar to the same concepts here, but there are differences. So the first one of these fine grain ones is a pipeline barrier. And you can see on the right, I put the command that generates pipeline barrier. The right, it's quite detailed. There's quite a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's a set of pipeline stages. So rather than just saying I want to, so not oh, sorry, let me just take a step back. They basically say I want to synchronize what went before with what's coming after this command um, at a sort of high level. Uh, but you actually specify a precise set of pipeline stages that are synchronized. So you might split synchronize the vertex stage of the previous draw call with the fragment stage of the next draw call, for instance, something like that. Um, and that you would express in these stage masks. So in the source stage mask, you say the vertex stage, and in the um, destination, you put the fragment stage for that particular <coughs> example. There's also a set of memory barriers expressing the any memory accesses you're doing in those. Uh, I won't go into them just now, I'll come back around to that in a minute. But the key thing is that they are a single point in time. It's everything before with everything after within the constraints of the art that you provided. And the pipeline barrier, when you execute one, if you provide the appropriate memory barriers, that's basically equivalent to what a GL memory barrier is. A uh, GL memory barrier is a memory um, barrier plus an execution dependency. So it effectively expresses a full memory dependency in GL at a quite coarse level. Whereas a pipeline barrier does not necessarily have to express. So an event is kind of similar to a pipeline barrier. Um, there's a bit more to it, though. So firstly, it's actually an object rather than just a command that you put in, in a command buffer. <coughs> you have a VK event object. And the reason for this is that they operate over a range. You don't just say it's this before and after. You start it at some point, and then you wait on it later. So it's signaled and then waited on. 
Um, this actually means they have a state, so they have an unsignaled state and a signaled state, which means you have a set operation to signal it and a uh, reset operation to unsignal it. Uh, each of these, again, takes a stage mask. So you can say in the set and reset, you can say at what stage does this trigger. So if you say vertex stage again, then after the previous draw calls before that command are finished, at the vertex stage, that's when that event will trigger. And then in the wakes, you have pretty much the same info you have in the pipeline event, where you have to duplicate that stage mask so we know what you're talking about, because again, it may not even be the same command, but and you also have the destination stages as well, so that you know what you're waiting on. They also have this nice property where you can have some CPU in, you interaction with them. Uh, they're a lot, it's a lot more simplistic when you're doing stuff in the CPU because there's not really any pipeline stages on the CPU, you're just synchronizing with whatever you've decided you are doing on the CPU. Uh, so very simply, you can set them, you can reset them the same as you can in a command buffer. And you can also get the status, there's no explicit weight, um, as you'll notice. You can obviously do a spin lock, but the whole purpose of the point of the event is meant to be very lightweight. So it's not really meant to be an OS primitive necessarily. So there's not particularly going to be a faster way that the implementation could do a wait for you. You're just going to have to figure it out. Uh, there is, this does come with a bit of a caveat uh, at the moment. So if you submitted a command buffer waiting on an event and you intended to set that, so signal it on the CPU, you have to be careful to set that pretty soon after you uh, submitted the queue. That's it, it's queue. Because there is a possibility that the OS may actually time you out and thus you'll lose your device and all that rendering you've just done has gone to waste. So unless you really need it, it's a good idea to ask yourself, can you just defer the submission? Um, there are some use cases such as late latching of data potentially for VR maybe, um, but they are very specialized and it's worth thinking about it before you do it. So they both specify similar things, so there's obviously a question of when do you use each. Uh, pipeline barriers are basically intended for when you have the operation that you're depending on happening right before the operation that is going to depend on it. So there's no work in between. Probably cheaper and easier to use a pipeline barrier. You just create an object. It's likely that implementation may do a faster thing than just passing the whole object, uh, event object into the chain. Um, so that's when you will use it. However, ideally, you want to be moving to a situation where you can put some work in between and events because that gives the GPU more um, opportunity to pipeline, on, uh, pipeline work like we showed in the first stage. And in that situation, that's when you want to use an event because then you can set the event immediately after your first operation and then wait on it immediately before the next operation. And then in between, any work that you do will be pipelined alongside it. It's not dependent, that's the idea. So before I get onto subpass spencies, I'll circle back to memory barriers. So there's three different types of memory barrier in Vulkan, and there's a little bit of a balancing act to which ones you use, although there are specific uses for all of them. So the first one is the global memory barrier. This one's red. No, ah, skipping again. First one is the global memory barrier. Um, so this sort of sets you up for the rest of them as well. It's the most simple kind of barrier you can do. It basically just says, what stage is accessing what memory and when is it, where is it flushing to so that I'm going to be able to view the results of that in another stage. And you'll notice that there are stage masks here again and maybe you're asking, wait, hang on, these are going with the events, why am I specifying the stages again? Uh, the reason for that, well, you, firstly, they do, map, they do match up somewhat. Um, again, I mentioned before that you don't have to specify an execution dependency and a memory dependency at the same time, you can do them separately, just why you have part of the reading information. Uh, it's also possible that you may want to have an execution dependency and not have a memory dependency for a particular stage. So it's specified twice, and there is some difference in how those masks are specified as well. The main use case for the global memory barrier is it's got a lot of resources, and they're just doing very simple transitioning. Like you're taking <coughs> your uniform buffers from a previous frame and transitioning them to be uh, written on the host. You might want to just do a global memory barrier to say, look, just take all this memory and let me have it. Buffer barriers are a little more complicated, but again, they've got the access masks. Um, rather than operating on all memory that's currently in flight. Oh, <laughs> more attention. Um, so rather than operating all memory in flight, it operates on a specific buffer and a specific range within that buffer. So you can be very precise with this. Um, 
obviously, if you're going to specify every byte with a single buffer barrier, that's kind of the case of going back and using uh, a global memory barrier. The other thing they do specify is if you're sharing data between two different queues or more queues, uh, you can actually change the queue as a shift while you're doing the memory barrier as well. So you can say my compute queue is moving into the graphics queue. They may just be shared as well. I, this should, I believe Chris will be talking a little bit about that later. And finally, this is, again, another layer of complexity added on. Uh, so we've got everything ahead of the buffer, except obviously it's a range of an image now, so that's not like uh, width and height and offsets. It's sort of a set of um, array elements or mitmatch uh, levels as well. As well, they also have uh, image layouts, which I can't remember if we talked about. I know we talked about it in the break. Uh, the idea of an image layout is that it sort of allows a driver to use that find what it is first. It's basically, it's uh, an abstract concept. So one of the image layouts may be general. You may have one that's suited for uh, shader reads, one that's suited for frame rights. And the idea here is that it's uh, sort of, um, you, you define your usage for an image up front, but then the layout says, this is the usage I'm going to do now. Uh, and it gives you a, a driver an opportunity to go, right, well, I support this compression scheme for this type of access, or this compression scheme for this type of access. I'm going to transition to, or anything else it may want to do as well. Oh, and yeah, quick uh, performance thing. Uh, if you do have it, find you end up having to switch very frequently. It may be better to use general. It may not. It depends on your use case again. How good everything test profile read equals performance problems. So subclass events. The reason I said I've done this last is it is slightly different. I mean, firstly. If you can remember from Andrew's slide, they are actually defined as part of render pass when you first create it and don't put them in line into a command buffer. So they're actually just a struct. They define a lot of the same things as the other two do, uh, but they do it at a different rate. And rather than having explicit memory barriers, they just basically have the same uh, flags that a global memory barrier does. So you can define those things here. One thing that I didn't mention before is this uh, dependency flag. So we already talked about, uh, or Andrew already talked about the idea of having pixel local access uh, for some uh, input attachments. Um, you can also do things like if you have a an image, not a input attachment or a buffer, where you know you're only accessing a particular value from a particular pixel location, you can basically say, I have this dependency. I know that I'm only going to care about this um, dependency on a per pixel basis, and you can put that flag in there, and it allows you to specify a sort of more fine-grained, um, possibly more optimal uh, dependency, particularly on a tile that you can avoid the flush. There's actually a couple of variations on this. So typically, a subclass dependency is between two subclasses. But you've also got self-dependencies. Firstly, um, and this allows you to put a pipeline barrier within it, within subclass. Uh, this might be something you use if you're doing programmable blending, for instance. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how you would do that, but the idea is basically that you would wait on the previous pipeline stage uh, using the dependency by region. There is a couple of limitations on when you use pipeline barrier in a render pass. You can only do forward progress, and you can't, it has to be by region if it's in a practice. And the reason for that is that anything else would cause a tile to flush. I'm not going to cover right exactly why that's hugely bad. It's very bad for reasons I'm not going to go into, but we want to ask afterwards to be free. And then there's uh, the other flavor is external dependency. So this is if you set an event outside before the render pass is begun, you can then wait on it after, uh, during render pass. And that allows you to do things like build up a drawing direct struct. Actually, I've got some so let's have a look at it. Um, so this is an example of how you might use a pipeline barrier, um, or actually two pipeline barriers. So texture uploads, uh, Michael I think talked about it a bit earlier uh, in terms of how you would do it with uh, transferring data and what resources you use. The idea is basically that you need to have your source, if you're doing a staging map, you need to have your source uh, resource and your destination resource. Both of them need to transition states at certain points, and you need to define all that as an application for So here we've got a buffer memory barrier where I'm setting the access from host, right? So let's assume I've already written my data into a buffer, into some memory, a VK memory object I've mapped. 
So I've written to that. I now want to say, right, I've written to it. I now want to get it ready to transfer to the image. So that's, that's what that first bit's doing. Uh, and then we have a source earth cosmos be image barrier. So that isn't coming from anywhere. I've not used the image before, so it's just starting from the slate. And I'm moving that to be written to by a transfer operation. And similarly, I've got no previous layout. It's completely undefined. But I'm trans uh, changing it to a layout where I'm going to be doing uh, transfers to it. So that's what that is. Uh, then the stage is in the actual pipeline barrier when we get to it. Uh, I'm saying I've got the host bit, which says I did something. CPU, so that was my CPU write that I've already done in that memory, and then I'm writing it out uh, via a transfer operation in the next bit, and then finally do the transfer, and then the bottom is basically just reversing uh, the transfer, so uh, I'm coming out of the transfer and then moving to shape readability, so that you can actually use that uh, in shape. And then an example of subclass dependencies, so. This uh, is actually going to, I'm just going to cover the external ones because they're probably the most interesting, I think. Um, so, firstly, the source and desk subpass are usually set to a number that is an index of the subpass from the render pass. For the external dependency, you use this special value BK subpass external, which I think is minus one. That's my pain up there. And so, the example, is, uh, yeah, so the example here is uh, using a compute shader <coughs> to basically do something with the geometry and figure out exactly what you're going to be drawing, some sort of cutting up room, actually. And then updating your drawing direct structures that you're going to be doing for your draw calls. So, the idea here is that you've got your source stage is going to be a uh, compute shader, and then your destination stage is going to be your direct stage. So, Draw and direct stage is interesting. Um, it's not just like uh, actual shader stages in pipeline stages. It's also all the weird fixed function bits that happen in between, uh, including the draw and direct read uh, that that counts as the pipeline stage. And then the access masks again, setting them to the appropriate things. So I'm writing from shader, and then I'm going to read it as uh, indirect. So that's what's that there. After we've set that up. Uh, in the subpass, then you can do your dispatch, you can set the event again with the same uh, source stage as the subpass, so they have to match. Uh, and then you can transition it. Uh, after you've started the render pass, you can do a wait event by using this external dependency, again with the same source stage, and uh, well, yeah, the access masks and the uh, pipeline stages match exactly the external dependency ones. And then after that, then you can use that to draw your draft up first. So, so I'm actually going quite well. Last time I ran out of time, did this in 12 minutes. So this is so much. Um, I'm running out of time. So, same of course. Uh, so, again, I said these are used to synchronize queues. So, a lot more core strains than the, what we talked about previously. Uh, a queue submit operation actually takes a number of different submissions at once. And each of those submissions can have a set of seven calls associated with it, both for waiting and to be signal. Uh, there's also some implicit memory guarantees when you do this. There's no memory barrier associated with the seven call. Uh, but what it does say is that once a seven call has signaled, uh, any effect, any memory that has been accessed by the things that are in that execution dependency are visible to future accesses on the same device. That's a bit of so they're not guaranteed to be visible to the host. So a quick, very quick example of what this might be used for. Uh, the main thing you might be using for it right now is uh, for uh, WSI, for the Windows system stuff, uh, particularly around the acquire. It's not too good. Yeah. Uh, so when you do an acquire image, I, this will make more sense in the context of our this example uh, talk later. Uh, when you acquire an image from a swap chain, you will get a sample that will trigger when it's done. Uh, and then when you submit your command buffer, you're going to be drawing to that image. So you sort of need to know when you've actually been given and you've got ownership there. Uh, so you can pass that in and wait for it in the graphics solution. Uh, then you can wait for, again for another sample to wait on that graphics task to complete. And then when it's complete, you then want to present it back to the presentation engine. And to do that, you wait on that image you present. So that's relatively straightforward, as some of the other stuff we've talked about. It's actually even simpler if you have, like on Android, uh, the um, presentation and graphics queue in the same queue. 
uh, in that case, you only need the apply semaphore for the, the, uh, for the apply next definition because uh, there's some implicit guarantees between operators on the same queue. And finally, fences. Uh, so these are used to synchronize queues CPU. Uh, they're really, really cost grade, more so than the, the submit info, the semaphores. They actually are per command rather than per submit. Um, they, again, have the same sort of implicit guarantees as semaphores, so once they're done, they have the same, same exact uh, things. Again, not guaranteed to be visible to the host. Uh, GL's fences are quite similar to this, although they also incorporate some semaphore functionality because you can wait from the GPU. Um, but they're very vaguely similar to this otherwise. Uh, so, one, the main, pretty much the main reason you would use these is to deal with multi-buffering. So if you've got multiple frames in flight and you've got dynamic data, you typically want to have multiple copies of resources in flight to be able to update it without serializing the GPU and CPU. Uh, so by having a number, uh, the number I picked here is actually the same number of uh, images I've got in my swap chain, that's typically what I'm paying for because you usually want those values to match. And very conveniently, the acquire function actually gives you the index of the image you're about to use, and you can use that in index to index into other resources as well, and it all just sort of works, which is quite nice. So, what you might do is acquire an image, have a let's get on, use that index, then wait wait for the fence for that image. Uh, sorry, wait for the, that particular index fence. So you waited for that previous time that frame executed effectively. Uh, and then reset that fence so that you're ready to use it again. Then you may change the data. Well, now that you know that fence is triggered, you can then change the data in the resources that are associated with that frame, which you know that frame is going to be executed. And then you can submit that stuff again with those resources and with that fence so that it gets triggered again. So again, you know when it's done. And last but not least, wait idle. This is really, really heavy weight. If if anyone uses this in the rendering loop, you're doing that thing I said that was valid to start serializing everything. So there's two flavors of this. There's queue wait idle, which waits for all queue operations, like queue submit, queue present to finish. Uh, it's sort of equivalent of waiting on a fence for those queues. And then there's device wait idle. You'll notice that the prototypes are broken, just ignore that. Uh, and device wait idle wait for all queues to basically does BK queue wait idle for all queues, plus waits for some device operations that aren't part of the queue. Uh, these are kind of quite similar to GL finish, so they should be sparingly. Uh, the, the main reason these are here, and the, probably the only reason you should be using it, is for teardown. Uh, basically, when you finish a route and you're done with everything, you want to take, to destroy everything, and then use device weight idle and just go, right, I know everything's done, it's safe, I can delete it, I'm done. Uh, every other time, please use other synchronization methods, because this is otherwise very bad. <coughs> really, really good to go over time, but not much. So, this is hard. You've got to specify exactly the right amount of synchronization. If you do too much, you may end up serializing something you didn't intend to. If you miss anything, then you're going to hit these race conditions and bad stuff happens, potentially. Uh, the validation layers can help. I don't think they have too much in the way of synchronization help at the moment, though they're, they're, they, they are making progress. Uh, in particular, I'd suggest you pay attention to the pipeline stages, particularly for tilers. You want to make sure that you're not waiting on primary stages if you don't have to. Away from the vertex stage, you get some nice overlap. Uh, but they do, they do become intuitive as you use them, you just need to start thinking about it. Uh, pay attention to image layouts, think about how you're using them. Certain GPUs, not all of them, will make use of that. Um, again, it's something you really need to tune all about which you care about because a lot of them do not care. And so that's basically everything. Uh, so, yes, keep the GPU fed without getting better. Do I have any time questions? Probably not. Yeah? Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, break next, so it's fine. Uh, so you've got to go have a copy of your other questions. Any questions? the synchronization as all of them are blocking. What I would be interested in is uh, on a GPU, when I'm doing uh, using the DMA engine to copy resources uh, to the GPU memory, why it's still using the graphics, graphics context? 
Is there any way to wait for a resource transition without blocking? Uh, well, I'm sorry, the, I the, yeah, yeah, the, the, the transfer, transfer operations can actually dump a, a space agency to, to the compute. I mean, the whole purpose of this explicit synchronization is that you don't wait on stuff that you don't have to do. So basically, the idea would be for that example, if it's on the same queue, for instance, what you would do is you would put in a wait of a, wait of a set event just after you specify the time, and then you wait for it, you wait for it. And there's no guarantee involved in that that will happen in order to compare to the rest of the commands. All that you will be guaranteed is that when you get to that wait, after you've that wait passed, you will have the result. So any uh, GPU that's capable of doing that is synchronous, and everything else will be able to do so. I typically, uh, in, this, in this new scenar scenario, as it's waiting for resource transition from multiple frames, so just streaming resources, I'm only using a subset of the frame for transition. Could you put the mic? On your mouth, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, right, so, uh, of course. Uh, uh, the reason I'm doing this is streaming resources in a large amount of resources in the GPU memory. Right. Yeah. So, you went streaming from the CPU or? Yes, and right. pretty much what I'm doing is transition large from number of buffers and uh, don't wait until they really just activate and start using them. The way it's handled it in normal OpenGL 4 is do separate two separate contacts uh, do the uh, oh, right, uh, transition a second context and do a GL, GL finish to force yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this, the, the, the thing of that is I don't necessarily guarantee you're doing this in GPU. the main reason you have done it is typically is so that you're not right? um, so that you're not blocking your CPU and your GPU yeah. right? you can still do that I mean you can build your command buffer for your transfer operations on another thread, for instance, yeah. and then when you submit again, it's going to be very lightweight. So once that thing is ready, you pass it back to your submission uh, thread and just submit it. And there's no CPU score going on there at all. It's just being done elsewhere. That's all. Yeah. Is there any uh, other questions or on the on the call at all? Okay. Um, the call is unmuted, so yeah. yeah.